Good morning, Propel Church. Good morning. And again, I know it's a little warm in here, but I know we can do just a little bit better than that. In fact, I'm going to need you guys this morning, so I'm going to ask just one more time for my sake. Good morning, Propel. How are we doing? Good morning. Morning, morning. Uh, do me a favor, just a real quick. Um, obviously, as you notice, uh, Pastor Jay is not here with us this morning. In fact, uh, he just finished dropping off Jared at college the, this weekend. Um, kind of a bittersweet moment. Uh, he was a, a phenomenal youth leader for us and a phenomenal youth when we had him. So it's obviously a bittersweet moment, but uh, they are on their way back. They should be back uh, this evening, in fact. So they wanted me to wish to you uh, the well wishes and thank you for all your prayers and thoughts uh, over this past week. Because, I mean, as you can imagine, as a parent, kind of sending your kid away is a bittersweet moment. So um, I, I, we've already highlighted more than once. So forgive me for highlighting it one last time. I know it's warm in here, but don't let that be the distraction to what God has for you this morning. In fact, we're going to move on from that point going forward. But I want to encourage you to press in more so to what God has for you this morning. And it's, let me be honest, it's not because of anything I have to say. It has little to do with me, but what God has planned for all of us today, this morning, for our lives. Um, for many of you know, I am the youth director here um, at Propel. Um, what you may not know is my lovely wife that's hiding in the back back there. Um, Jessica, would you stand, please? Just, just wave to everyone. She's, she's going to kill me for this, but I've got to take that opportunity. She is a, the definition of a behind-the-scenes worker. Thank you. She's a stay-at-home mom. We've got five amazing, wonderful, and crazy kids because they're a combination of me. So, like, you add that to that group, it's explosive like dynamite. Not only that, she does a tremendous job helping me lead the youth that are here. Um, she's involved heavily with a lot of the women's events that go on. And she's, like I said, she's the definition of a behind-the-scenes person. So, like I said, she's going to kill me for doing that today, but I, I needed to recognize her. And you guys may notice this amazing class and group of students we have here this morning. If you would give them a round of applause. These guys are absolutely phenomenal. I know so many times we run off and we go hide in the, the library next door here, but I want to highlight these guys and the amazing group they are. And this is just the half of them. We have several others that are out on vacation. Where else is going on? But God is doing something amazing in Propel. He is bringing families into this building each and every week to be touched by God. And I think that's amazing. And the youth now more than ever, they need your prayer. I mean, they are facing things that we never would have questioned growing up. Things that we took as a fact that they're now being called into question and having to debate biology and things of that nature. Things that we've known forever, but they're having to stand up on things that we just took for granted. So they need your prayer. Good. This morning, what I want to talk to you about is, I would title it as, distracted living. And now just to be fair, this is, as I tell them all the time, this is a safe place. You can be comfortable here, okay? But I need to know what kind of room I'm dealing with. So I need your help just a little bit. So I just want to ask, test the audience here for just a second. At any point in time, as by a show of hands, had you texted while you were driving? Okay, I've got some people that are fully comfortable. Okay, yes, it's definitely me. And I've got some of you that aren't quite okay raising your hand. We, we've all done it maybe once or twice. And I was going to let you know that Paul was in the back taking your names down. And he's going to be checking license plates after. But you're safe. You're safe. You don't have to worry about that right now, okay? Um, I, as we talk about distracted living today, before I get into it, I think I need to set the stage for just a quick second. Because this is honestly a little different for me. Um, it's more of a practical message. I, as my wife did attest to, I'm more of like a, a deep thinker kind of guy. I could sit and read systematic theology and debate theories and all that kind of stuff. I love that. I can enjoy that. It's good for me. But at the same time, that too much knowledge can sometimes be a bad thing, especially when it's not put into use. So today what I have for you is more of a, a practical message. And there's times that I've gotten up, we've spoken, we've, we've had teaching Sessions. In fact, if you haven't checked out our whole series on the names of God, I strongly encourage you to dive into our YouTube page for Propel and see. I guarantee you're going to learn something that's going to change your life. Even today, there's names in there that I can't quite pronounce properly, but I learned something from it. And I, I encourage you to dive in and dig in into that. Also, there's times we, we speak and we motivate. We try to inspire you. 
There's times you have a rough week, you come in, you're on empty, and you're looking for something just to fill you up. And you come in and you hear a message that pumps you up, gets you excited, you're ready to get right back out into the world and get going again. And, th- and those are all great and they have their purpose. But today, I want to leave you with something practical. I want to leave you with something that I hope, my prayer is, that it's tangible. Something you can hold on to. Because the thing is, sometimes when you face trials in your life and things come up against you, at least for me, maybe I'm the only one, but I forget some of the things I'm taught. The motivation that I had quickly diminishes in the face of fear and anxiety. So in a matter of moments, that all goes away. And my hope today is to leave you something that you can grasp a hold of firmly when you go through whatever trial you're going through or any obstacle that kind of comes up. And as I, it's, it's funny that all this stuff is kind of going on and happening because my, my intro and my thing I'm talking about here is I think sometimes the devil gets too much credit. I say that, and we're dealing with what we deal here, but I'm still going to stand proud and say, I think the devil gets too much credit. My car wouldn't start last night. I have no idea what's wrong with it, but I still think the devil gets too much credit, and he doesn't deserve that. Because here's the thing. I know what happened to Job in the Bible. I know everything he went through, but I also know he had to come to God and ask for permission to do anything to Job before he harmed his livestock, before he took his kids, before he took his health, before Satan did anything to Job, he had to find, he had to ask for permission. And I got to be honest because I'm a guy, I'm a married guy. I find it funny that Satan took away everything, his livestock, his house, his flock, even his own health but he left his wife. He, he got rid of everything else, but Job's wife, he decided, no, I, I can leave that there for there. I, there's a purpose and point in leaving Job's wife for this testing and the trial. To me as a husband, I, just, I found that kind of humorous. But it, I will still, like I said, stand on the fact that devil gets too much credit for things that are there. God, he has to go before God and ask for permission. He has to get an okay for it. And so many times when we're off the mat, it's not the devil, it's us. I love psychology. I'm a psychology nerd. I love the way our brains are wired and the way they work simply because to me, it's God's fingerprint on us. It's our unique individual selves because none of us are exactly alike. We're all wired and we all operate differently and we all think differently, but sometimes that goes wrong. So today, when I talk about distracted living versus intentional living today, I'm not going to give you a list of to-dos of read your Bible, pray, study, tithe. You guys get that. It's not a practical in that sense that you're going to walk away knowing those things and what a distracted living looks like. Because I think you get an idea when you see on the road a distracted driver, you can point them out easy, right? They're swerving all over the place. They're not quite in their lane. The blinker never got on. They cut you off, whatever it may be. You know what distracted driving is like. You know what distracted living is like. So this morning, it's more of a perspective, more of a shift and focus on how we view and see things and how we need to align our perspective in a proper way. So, I mean, I can't think of a more practical guy in the Bible than Peter. So today we're going to read 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, Peter's a guy who swore he would not deny Christ and then went ahead to, to do so. He's the one that cut off an ear. He's the one that when he saw Jesus on the shore, he jumped out of the boat to go greet Jesus. Didn't even hesitate or think about it. He typically speaks first and thinks later. He's my kind of guy in regards to practicality. In fact, actually, if you compare Peter and Paul, Paul's usually that super apostle that's got all those deep theories. And I like actually in the end of Second Peter, he kind of says, you know, Paul, some of his teachings are tough. Some people get confused about them. And he kind of leaves it by saying, good luck with that. Because it's Paul, and Paul, that's just the way he is. But today, we're going to look at Peter, and we're going to start in verse 5 of chapter 1. And it says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed of his former sins. Now I could literally spend all day till each every one of you get too hot and walk out of here talking about this scripture because it is just that deep and it is that wonderful but to be honest I as much as I want to highlight each of those virtues and each of the things he's talked about not only do I not have the time today I feel like this is something that I wanted to leave you with today I felt like 
I could talk about it and I want to discuss it, but it's something more that you get to go home with and take. And I strongly encourage you, especially chapter one of Second Peter, read it. Take it home when you study something this week. Make it be your study. That's your morsel to take home and think over because it is deep and it is profound. It talks a lot of what we're talking about here in a more drawn out way. So if you see on your notes and your outlines, if you have version pulled up, you probably see it there. Our step one is to acknowledge where you came from. And we get this from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, and the passions of our flesh, carrying out desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God... But God, being rich in his mercy, because he is of the great love with which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Such a strong, powerful message talking in regards to our sin and the things that we've done. And to be honest, I don't think I need to spend too much time there. Josh did a phenomenal job a few weeks ago highlighting how our sinful nature is and the intricacies of it. In fact, he went through and talked about the Old Testament law and how it kind of went through the checklist of lying, stealing, cheating, all those things. And most of us could raise our hands on a lot of those points saying, yeah, I, I broke in that. Yeah, I, I, I sinned in that area. And then he made it worse by going to New Testament and talking about Jesus and his commitment and discussion about anger and lust. And many of us find ourselves in that same area. Like, yeah, I've got anger. Yeah, thought and pure thoughts. And you know what? We check that box too. We all live with ourselves on a daily basis. You know what you think. You know your actions. You, you see yourself as you are. So I don't think I need to necessarily spend excessive amounts of time on beating you up. It's, 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 you've got that. That's not my intention to focus. Instead, I want to look at a little further down in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. You see, what we believe here in this room today is unique among the world. There's a lot of other religions out there that say a lot of different things. More often than not, it's a discussion about how we can enter the afterlife, enter into heaven, and how we go about doing it. And most religions discuss and talk about it as a, a thing that we do. It's our actions. It's our deeds. It's the things we say. It's the little old lady I helped cross the street. It's my good intentions. And we're stacking up the scale with good things to try and outweigh the bad. So when we get to the afterlife, we'll have salvation. But see, that's not what we believe here. You're here today. We believe that there is one way to heaven. Just one. And that is an acceptance and admittance of your sins and what you have done, your failings, and your falling short of the glory of God. Accepting, repenting of your sins, turning to God, accepting him as Lord and Savior in life, and believing in him with all your heart. And if you do, you can have eternal salvation. That's what we believe here this morning. But I want to point something out a little more. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, even the faith we have in Christ was given to us. That you know what, for me personally, this was a profound hit for me because the reality is, as Ephesians plainly lays out, we were all children of wrath. We were all disobedient. And not just in the things we did in our actions, but our actual mindset was opposed to God. The way I think was completely contrary to him. I was so lost in my way that I couldn't even recognize what I was doing was wrong. It felt good. It was good in my eyes and I was all set. But then God stepped in through grace, his provenient grace, and opened my eyes and helped me to see that I was wrong. That's why the law exists. That's why Jesus has the list, to show us and reflect to us that we have broken his law. And by grace, your eyes can be opened to see that the things we are doing, the things we're acting on are wrong and impure. And God opens our eyes to that. So in accepting him as Savior, I can't even hold myself is making a decision, it's more or less God opening my eyes to see him, to know that what he has is so much sweeter than what I have, that the life that he has for me is so much better that I can follow. You see, for grace being saved, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not, not a result of work so that no one may boast. See, it's tough, and I'll be honest, as tough of a pill this is to swallow, I promise you that the results are so much better because at first it seems bitter. 
at first it seems tough to digest because it's not just the things I've done wrong. It's not the actions. It's my very mindset. It's my very will that's set apart from God. But the good news about that is we're all in the same boat. We all have been there. We were all once children of wrath. We all have been sons of disobedience. But God has stepped in for each and every single one of us. It puts us on a level playing field. When I, when I was preparing the sermon this week, it, it just kept continuing to echo and ring in my ear. Because if I can acknowledge where I've been and where I've gone or where he's taking me, it's the perspective and the lens of which we see things through life. And as we go through this, we're going to keep going back to step one and looking at it. It's our frame of reference and how we're going to look from this point going forward. So knowing that now, step two, walk and listen humbly. James chapter four, verse six and seven says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You could pick and choose almost any verse in the Bible that talks about pride, and they kind of have the same discussion. They all kind of say the same thing, that God directly opposes the proud, that God detests haughty eyes, that God cuts down the pride, that pride comes before the fall. It's very clear reading through the Bible that pride isn't a good thing, but I feel sometimes we misunderstand what genuine pride is, what it is. We, especially as Christians, we can take it, we misinterpret what it is. So the definition I have for you this morning in pride is this, a feeling or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. The achievements of whom with whom one is closely associated or from the qualities or possessions that are widely admired. So it's a deep pleasure or satisfaction derived by one's own achievements. You see, God has no choice but to oppose the, the proud, the boastful. Because to be proud and boastful is to take pleasure in your own actions. And what we just clarified in step one in our acknowledgement, our frame of reference is the fact that I am standing here before you today is by the mercy of God. The fact that I am breathing air this morning and having a discussion with you is by God. Because you see, it's not just because of the actions and things I've done. The very life that I lead is a result of God supporting and taking care of me. Amen. By being there for me. And when you give in to pride, when pride starts to take root, and I, it, it, I it promise you, it's, it's sneaky. Pride is a malignant tumor or cancer left unchecked that can lead to death. You don't see it at first. Even as Christians, you can live in a false sense of pride and feel like you've got everything together. You're submitting to God. You're, you're open and acknowledging the things you've done wrong. But at the same time, when you look out in the world, you kind of see some of the faults that are in. And it's very easy to slip up and let pride sneak in and start to think that, well, you've got a little bit better together than them. That pride sneaks in and kind of goes, looks at you and goes, the success you have, Brent, is because of you and the effort you put in. It's very easy to slip back and think that my success is because of my own hand. And that's exactly why God has to directly oppose it. Because for me to take pleasure in my own actions is to completely dismiss God and everything that he's done. It completely negates him from the picture because it's about me. And the problem is when you start to, when pride begins to manifest, you start to look out in the world and now all of a sudden you've gotten success. You start to feel a little proud about what you've accomplished and the bad things that start to happen in your life, that's somebody else's fault. Well, the promotion I'm not getting at work, it's, it's my boss. He doesn't like me. It's a personality clash. I know I put the effort in. I can show you the success I've had. That's on him. When things go wrong in the car or anything else I'm dealing with, well, it's not because I went 120 down the road and decided to spin out or something insane in my car. It's because I didn't treat my car properly. So that's why it has to be taken care of and it has to be fixed. The pinnacle of pride is you start to, you continue to feel arrogant. You continue to build yourself up in such a way that you look out on the world and you see the problems that it has you see the success that you also have, and you start to think that you're the solution for that problem. When so-and-so is going through something, you've already mastered it. You've already handled it. Let me step into that situation and fix it. The people who have problems, that's their fault. Let me step in and fix it. And you see what you start to do is usurp God. In fact, you start to put yourself as Christ, Lord and Savior in their life because for some reason you've got it better together than them. So in pride, you step in into the picture as if you're their personal Christ and you're going to save them. Of course, God has to oppose the proud. 
Of course, he cannot support that anyway. He can't allow that to continue and manifest, so he has to oppose it. And the reason why I picked James, the reason why I enjoy this verse so much is because of the latter part. It says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You see, when you keep the lens in perspective that without God, I wouldn't be here, the fact that he saved me from all my sins, everything that I went through, and you truly genuinely acknowledge the things that you have done and you reconcile that in your own heart and see them as wrong before God. And you see that how he has saved you from that. And not just yesterday, but today. I don't know about you guys. I've been saved for a while and I still struggle. I still sometimes have a hard time getting out of bed and getting to work and putting on the full mantle and armor of God and representing God to his greatest glory because I have slips and I have falls. Sometimes I am not a good father. I most certainly, many of times, am not a good husband. I've been married 11 years. That is by the grace of God, 100%, because I wouldn't have put up with me this long. I'll, I'll be honest. So God bless my wife and her patience, because I, I wouldn't, couldn't do it. So when that is our constant perspective, it, doesn't, it forces pride to leave the room, because you realize it's not about you. It can't be because it's what he's saved you from. And so when you are in that perspective and mindset, you, you're almost in the perspective of somebody kneeling and submitting to the one who has rescued and saved you. So when you submit to God, when you acknowledge what he's brought you from and what he saved you from and how he's sustaining you day in and day out, you can submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee, which means in submission to God, the devil cannot touch you. I mean, because the devil has no right to touch you. But more importantly, you know what's on God. It takes the pressure off. He's, he's got you in your hands, which then means on the other side of that coin, when pride starts to build up and manifest, man, you're putting an open for business sign for the devil. You're saying, come on in, because pride says, I got this. I got this thing covered. And when those temptations come and you start to think, well, you're the one that solved that problem. I, I, I handled my own addiction to pornography. I handled my own addiction to alcohol. I handled my own whatever it may be, fill in the blank. You think you got it. So when the devil comes knocking, you're going to fall on your face because your chest got puffed up and proud and you forgot the one who saved you from it. You forgot the one who rescued you out of, you, rescued you out of your sin rescued you out of your situation. Being prideful only invites problems into your life. So we need to walk humbly. But it's not just walk humbly. We need to listen humbly. Many of you know you have that person in your life. Doesn't matter what the conversation is with that person. Talk about your kids, your marriage, and talk about Jurassic Park. And somehow they can still turn that conversation about them. You can be talking about dinosaurs, and they can still talk about how those dinosaurs have, are nothing, have got nothing on them or whatever the case may be. You know that person in your life that makes it about them. And see, that's the thing with pride. Pride takes pleasure in your own accomplishments. If you take pleasure in your own accomplishments, how can you take pleasure in what somebody else is doing? Pride leaves no room for anyone. It leaves room for you and you alone. It ha it's suffocating in that way. It only pushes people away. In fact... If someone tells you about the successes they've had in their life, that's a threat to your pride because all of a sudden their success is somehow diminishing your success and that somehow them doing better than you is a threat on you. And when you're prideful, you can never engage in genuine and authentic relationship with someone because you're only concerned about yourself. That's all you care about. And that's no way to live. The converse of that is, again, acknowledging. We're going to keep coming back to it. Put the glasses on. See what God has saved you from. When you have the glasses in perspective right, when you see that speck in somebody else's eye, you're going to remember that there's a log sticking out of yours. You're not going to look and judge and condemn them because you know what God has saved you from, which means you can enter into a conversation and a relationship with someone in a freeing way. You can genuinely listen to somebody. And let me tell you, if you just listen to someone, you will be shocked and amazed at what they will tell you. They will open their heart to you. And as believers, this is our biggest toolkit to go talk to an unbelieving world. If we just go to them with an open heart and open ears and listen to them. 
we don't give them tips. We don't give them advice and all the different things about how they could be better because we remember where we came from. We remember the mistakes we made and we're just gonna be there as a friend and we're gonna listen and we're gonna be there for them when they need to. And guess what? That creates change. That creates relationships. That creates a bond that's not easily severed. That creates an open, honest relationship on both ends to where you can communicate with one another in such a way that you have a deep and meaningful relationship. When we acknowledge where we come from, and we, excuse me, when we acknowledge where we came from and who we are, it leaves no room for pride. So then step three, aim for heaven while avoiding hell. In Hebrews chapter one, verse two, one of my favorite passages of the Bible, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, these cloud of witnesses refers back to chapter 11. In chapter 11, it's literally like the wall of heroes in the Bible. It's Moses, it's Isaac, it's Abraham, all the big superheroes in the Bible of faith. And it's saying, so since we're surrounded by all those heroes of the faith, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that so cling so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, when I say aim for heaven, while avoiding hell, I'm not talking about a distant, eternal reality. We've already clarified that. We've already talked about it. There's nothing you can do here today to stack the deck in your favor. I can help 50 old ladies cross the street. I can cut down trees and help people out all I want, but that's not what's going to help me get there. So I'm not talking about a distant eternity. I'm talking about a more of a mental or maybe even metaphysical reality that we kind of live and walk in. And you know what I'm talking about in the sense that some of you have had some really good days where everything just seems to be going in your favor. The job's going well. The boss likes you. Maybe you just got a raise. Your wife made a really lovely dinner for you and you just loved it. It was awesome and amazing. Your kids brought home straight A's and they actually said, I love you, dad, instead of all the other things they typically say. It's a different high. Everything you're doing is clicking and everything is working and you feel almost as if you're in heaven. Conversely times, there are some of you in here today that know exactly what I'm talking about when I say I'm walking through hell. That you feel like the world is against you. That everything that happens, happens against you to hurt and inflict pain on you. I told you I've been married to 11 years to the most wonderful woman in my life. I was 19 when I got married. I've got five kids. You don't think I had a rough time figuring out how to be married and being a father? I'm a kid. That's why I do youth, because I can hang out with them and be them. That's me. She'll tell you if you don't believe me. I know I act all serious here, but at home, I, I like to have fun and cut loose. That's, that's who I am. More importantly, I, I know because I've walked through it. One of the things that I've dealt with for most of my life is depression. Severe depression. Um, it hasn't been there for my entire life, but it's, it's been dormant. And there are times where that peaks and that elevates. And I had a situation at work a long time ago in a different company where I, I had given them uh, all that I have. I mean, I, I, took, I turned my work, my career, made it my primary focus. It was my foundation. Everything that I stood on in the intention, good intention of taking care of my family, providing for them, making sure that they had all that they needed. And I gave, at this point in time there, it was like five years of that company where I was on the fast track, things were happening. I was looking to hit the next promotion and the next ladder, whatever that may be. I was in a position, I was 21, I got my first store. I was in a point at that age, making more money than my family. My parents were, like as a young growing up male, that's something like you aspire to. And for me, I had reached that point, but it became my world. And in no short time, some like five years in, I had a situation with a pharmacy manager in the back where he didn't quite like me running my store. The long story short is I get called into my office, my office with my management, um, my district manager, my pharmacy manager, and was then told that I was sabotaging my pharmacy, that I was sabotaging my store. And I can't tell you the hurt that that inflicted on me. I grew up in the South. My dad was a military dad. Guys don't cry. That, that doesn't happen. And sure enough, in that meeting, that didn't happen. But shortly thereafter, I went in the back room, talked with my assistant, 60-year-old Jewish gentleman, loved the guy. And I, I bawled my eyes out in front of him, asking if I was sabotaging my pharmacy. It may seem like a small thing in the context of whatever else, but for me, that was my world, and it literally shattered. 
in some small time, it was, I was vindicated. It came out that what was happening was just a personality conflict and somebody was going to attack me. And that's great and wonderful, but the damage was already done. I fell into a severe deep depression for several years and I didn't know how I was going to get out. I was bad. Guy, there was, there's days that I couldn't get out of the bed. Like it was in a dark place that I never want to return to. The things that I know I saw and witnessed, I got to the point, this is our safe place, our room. I can be honest with you guys, where I didn't want to live. I had no will to live. That's despite having a lovely wife and a lovely family. To me, the pain of this world was just too much to bear, and I didn't want to bear it anymore. But praise God that he intervened, that he stepped in, and he helped me. He gave me these words that have been the greatest influence on my life and has helped me because if you know anyone that deals with depression and struggles with it, it's not just done and over with. It's something that kind of is persists and entangles you and stays with you. So you've got to be focused. But this idea, this message of aiming for heaven while avoiding hell was the best piece of advice that I had ever gotten because, you know, I knew where I was at wasn't where I wanted to be. I wasn't satisfied. I, even in the best of times, even when things were going right, I wasn't content or happy with where I was at. I knew that there was something better. My, my heaven, my reality, and that was a relationship, a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ where I was following him. And you see, as I begin to submit and acknowledge my brokenness, where I've been, where I am, and my need for him on a daily basis, I was able to surrender all that I had. Because let's be honest, it wasn't working. Whatever I was doing wasn't fixing things. No matter what book I read, what schooling I went to, no matter how many jumping jacks I did, it, it didn't matter. Whatever I was doing wasn't working, so it was time for God to take over. And when he did that, he started to change me. And I started to see a move closer to heaven. And I started to see myself pulling myself from the depths of hell closer to heaven. And see, the thing is, when you look all the way down that road, that's a, it's a, it almost seems like it's more than, it's a bigger bite than you can chew. It's, it's a bigger thing you can do, and it can almost push you back the other way. But the reality is today, what I want to leave you with is be a better you today than yesterday. I don't care about the person sitting to your left or to your right, your coworker, or any other influence you have in your life. The person on Facebook that just seems to have everything going right, they bought the new Chevy Silverado, and it's gorgeous, it's lifted, and it's great. In the meantime, I have a car that's not quite working. Like, th that's not what we're talking about here. Focus on you and God. Be a better you today than you were yesterday. And here's the thing. When you start focusing on improvements for yourself, little by little, God starts to change you. Your perspective starts to shift. You start to see what God is doing in your life. And little by little, you start seeing yourself moving closer to heaven. And you start seeing you're closer to that destination of heaven than you are hell. But here's the thing. You've got to keep your eyes on hell. And then and here's the thing. The reason being, it sounds bad to do that, but you need to remind yourself what God has saved you from. You need to remind yourself where you've been because when pride starts to knock on your door again and seat back in, things are going good. You've got it back together. You're kind of, you've dug yourself out a little bit and you're doing okay. God forbid you start to think you did it with your own actions. It was out of your own effort, and you forget that it was God who picked you up. Because when you keep a perspective of where hell is, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to enter that place. And when the devil comes knocking, and those old friends that you said get away come back into your life, and they start asking to see you again, and they start offering those same things that are your temptation again, you're going to remind yourself that I don't want to go back to that place. I've been there. I've been hurt there. I know what that feels like. And I am not returning by the grace of God there. And that's why I love Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, because it says strip off every weight and sin. It separates the two. It's not just strip off every sin, because we all deal with that. It says to lay aside every weight. As I try to climb myself out of the hole and I ask for God's help and I start pulling myself out of the way, I realized that I was carrying extra baggage, extra weight. And it wasn't just the sin. It wasn't just the things that I've done wrong. It was the distractions in my life. Whether that be video games, my career, my job, my lust, whatever, it may, whatever thing it may be, it wasn't just sin. It was the things that I allowed to slow me down and pull me away, relationships and things of the such. 
So as I started to pull off and remove those weights from me and start to focus on Christ, who was the author, the author, the perfecter and finisher of our faith, which means he created it, he's sustaining it, and he's going to see it to the end by God. It's, it's then on him. It's then on him. So as we start to work towards being a better us by the grace of God and we start heading in that direction, we submit daily. We remind ourselves where we've been, not to beat ourselves up, but just to push us closer to that goal. And I tell you, it'll give you a sense of joy and a sense of pleasure in God like you've never had before because you're going to wake up. And it seems silly, but the birds chirping outside are going to give you joy because you know what? God created it. The world you see, the world you interact with, it's going to it's going to affect and change you because now everything has God's fingerprint and everything has God's touch on it. But here's the thing. It, it can't stop, start, stop there. Excuse me. Step four. We are better together. There's a reason why we say this mantra over and over again because it is true. It is fact. Bottom line, you are better together. Pastor Jathan did a great message last week. Definitely check it out on YouTube. But he talked about how man is not created to be alone, that a brother who falls down can be picked up by another brother or sister and they can keep moving. A braided cord is not easily severed. You see, we all have our struggles and our temptations in life, the things we go through. When we acknowledge yet again where we've come and what God is doing, we can walk humbly, we can engage with others so we can let our guard down and talk with other people. So I'm not afraid to talk about the depression I've walked through. I'm not afraid to talk about the addictions I have because I know that brother or sister's not looking at me with judgment. He's looking at me because he's going to help me. Hey, maybe he's walked through it himself. Maybe he's going to pick me up and he's going to help me get through. When times are tough, they're going to reach out to you. It's not because they want to knock on your door on Monday morning saying, where are you at church? It's because they're, they're not doing it because of a sense of pride. They're doing it because they genuinely care. And maybe if you're not here on Sunday, they're concerned about you and they just want the best for you. So they're that brother and sister in life that's going to connect with you and that's going to help aid and assist you through. In Hebrews 10, it says on verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he promised for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. As great as it is to have another brother or sister helping you out in your walk with Christ, yet again, he can't stop there because it's not all about you, right? It's not just about Brent. It's not just about Jessica. It's not just about any one of you. It's, there's a bigger picture because here's the thing. When you find yourself plugging in to your local church, this wonderful church that God has established and is working in and through, Propel Church, when you connect through our small groups and our other avenues, you have then the opportunity to connect with others and help them through some of the same things you've gone through. You can help them through their struggles and their trials and tribulations. And not only that, when you do that, you find a meaning or purpose in life because you're living it in an intentional manner. You're living intentionally. And it's funny, this hit me last night. I was preparing for it. My son, Preston, if you guys don't know him, where have you been? <laughs> He's my last boy and he is all boy, like all boy. Now, mind you, again, when I say last boy, I've got five kids. He's my fourth son. So I've got three other boys I've been through, Brendan, Jaden, and Ethan. I had to remember that last one. There's sometimes too many names. I've been through boys. I know what they do. Preston, he's all of them and more. He got a little extra dose of Brent is what I'm thinking. I haven't confirmed it. He, he's the guy that he's running out in the field. He's acting like Hulk. He's punching walls. He's hitting things. I remember when Minecraft first kind of became a big thing. He couldn't have been, what, two years old? He had this little Minecraft hammer. He went to my in-law's house. I thought he was going to renovate the place. <laughs> he was knocking down walls and hitting things. He's the only kid, like, my, my in-laws had to, like, be serious with him, like, stop. Like, no. Like, draw the line. All the other kids, it's like, we can tell them no, and they get it. He's the one that's like, No put it down, step away, because he's just that kind of guy. But this week, he, he amazed me. I don't know what got into him, but we all have our chores at home. My, my one son helps my wife in laundry. The other son helps me with dishes. We all have our thing. I usually do the dishes at night after my wife cooks an amazing meal, and then I wipe down the counters after I do dishes. But my son, Preston, five, mind you, decides to, almost six, to wipe down the table. <coughs> For whatever reason, he got it into him. I showed him how to make sure to rinse out the rag so it's not leaking all over the place and it's a bigger mess for <clears throat> my wife to clean up later. 
Um, but I just made sure he knew. And then I watched him as he wiped down the table. I'm not kidding you guys. He spent 15 minutes wiping down that table. He went through every angle of that table. And the whole time as he's wiping down the tops, the sides, the wood legs, this table's so beautiful. This is an amazing table. In case you don't know, I've had this table for years. It might be older than Preston. I don't know. But the kid took so much care in it. And you know what he said to me? Not only that, when my wife came in the door, he jumped out, scared her. And like, I wiped down the table and bragged about how good of a job it is. And even this last night, we were having dinner. He's like, okay, you guys got 15 minutes. And then I'm wiping down the tables. You better hurry up and finish dinner. Like, I got, I, we got things to do, guys. And I'm going to make it good. And he, he, he's happy about what he's doing. You know what? He said to me, he said, Dad, I can finally take something off your plate. Dad, I can finally do something for you. Because you know what? When you contribute to something, you invest and engage in it. When you get involved in a small group of Propel Church, it's not just a time to hang out. While that's going to happen, you're going to have fellowship and a good time. It's a way to kind of roll up your sleeves with a partner and get dirty with the things of life because the things of life you need help with. And when you would do that, you're going to find a new sense of meaning like my son Preston did. And it's such a sweet, gentle nature from him too, because he's not normally that kind of a kid. He's a sweet kid, don't get me wrong, but there's something about the way he looks at the table when he does it. And the the true, in a proper sense of pride that he takes and what he's able to do and how he's grateful that he's old enough to clean the table now. It's not in this, oh, I'm the best and I'm whatever. It's like, I can finally do this and I can help and contribute. And that helps him to feel a sense of purpose in our family. That's his exact words. Like he feels a part of the family now because he can do something. We as believers have that same responsibility within our local body, within this wonderful church propel.